Hello friends, this is Self Critical Automaton, 37 rats in a trench coat, and today it's time for the next episode of my Dishonored Let's Play. So, today um, I want to mention really quickly first that I'm getting very close to 100 subscribers. I'm at like 97 last time I looked, and basically I'd like to at least hit 100 soon. Uh, that would get me a, um, a custom URL and also basically just make me feel very happy. Uh, if you like my work at all, please share it with other people. It really helps. Um, whenever that happens and you know this is a passion project for me i love making these videos but it, it makes me feel nice on the inside when people uh <laughs> when people watch them and when more people watch them so let's go hello Martin. i hear the second day is when the skin really starts to come all the way off is that true or is it the itching that really gets you or the rats jasper isn't it it's not so bad in here except i miss your wife Ha! Huh. You don't scare easy, I'll give you that. But that'll change. It's easy to be confident when you know there's an assassin standing behind the guy dissing you. What a sight you are in that mask. I know who you are and what you're here to do. And I can help. Unlock me and I'll buy you a drink in a couple of days. By the void, I'll buy you a hundred drinks. <sighs> Feels good to stand up straight. <sighs> Thank you, Corvo. What you're here to do tonight is of the highest importance. We've got to find Emily. So kill Campbell and make it quick. Once it's done, search his body for the journal, his notorious black book, and get out of there. Campbell is meeting with a guard named Kerr now, and word from my informant is that Campbell is going to poison him. Maybe you can use that to your advantage. All right, I won't be of any help here, so I'll make my own way back to the Hound Pits pub. If I see Samuel the Boatman, I'll tell him to pick you up in the backyard, behind the office of the High Overseer. May all the spirits guide you, and may our enemy's head hit the floor without you taking a scratch. Well, before we go do anything else, I want to see what the heart has to say. There are a few brave enough to laugh in the outsider's face. So it seems like regardless of whatever else it thinks, it respects him. Um, but yeah, so the first thing I want to do as we start here is that I would like to talk about my plan for how to deal with this guy, because then I won't have to remember to talk about it later. Also, Hatters fired the first shot, but Bottle Street Gang fired the last. This is a repeated graffiti throughout the game. It sounds painful. Have you ever seen the ritual? I've never seen the heretics used. No, it's a rare occurrence. But I did spy the face of one so branded. A former member of our order in the house. Out on a retreat, we passed through a fishing town and saw him begging. What were his crimes? Who can say? The brand is reserved for an overseer. Or even the high overseer himself, who violates our codes and must be cast out permanently. Remember the seven strictures, and you never need worry about such matters. I will. So, uh, they mention here, very conveniently and conspicuously, this uh, mysterious brand, which um, we will find out in a moment, is effectively, it's just a mark, and once you're marked with it, you are a non-person in the eyes of every member of the church. No one will talk to you, no one will help you, nothing. And considering this is the state religion of um, the empire that rules the world, that's a pretty bad situation for you to be in. Oh, fuck. Well, unfortunate for this guy. Maybe I should walk around with my crossbow out to prevent these kinds of accidents from happening in future. Um... <laughs> Anyway, so my plan is to brand him with that. This is the non-lethal option for this mission. I generally think that the non-lethal options don't make a lot of sense. This one is one of them. I think it's weirdly deus ex machina -y, that it, they just happen to have this one ritual that nobody is allowed to question, and if anybody ever, you know, is branded with it, then that's it. They're stuck forever as being no longer a person in the eyes of the church. I feel like, um, you know, if Catholicism had that kind of thing and you kidnapped the Pope one day and inflicted it on him and then broke out again 
the Pope would have a reasonable position to say, this was not done by me, this was not done by our order, this was an external person who decided to use our powers against us. I don't think it removes him from the map. However, from the, you know, the game board or whatever. However, um, there is a secret room in the bottom of this level, and in that room is all of the evidence you would need of him having broken all of their um, religious tenets. So, if that's the case, then it is much more believable to me that he would actually be uh, removed from office. And um, so, my goal will be to brand him and then leave him in that place, because then it looks like someone below him in the hierarchy has become sick of his hypocrisy and done this to him. Therefore, it becomes, you know, some brave person, some brave anonymous member of this church doing this to ensure that um, their tenets are upheld. Which I feel like they would be much more willing to um, accept and publicise, and also which uh, he would have a much harder time denying, because he, it's the brand that marks people who've broken all the tenets of the faith. They found faith. He, they found him branded in a pile of things that show how he broke the tenets of the faith. Even if most of them are corrupt and... Is there anything... I, why is this here? Is there any way I can... I guess I could dart someone in the foot from here, but that doesn't help me. So there's a couple of ways into this area, but uh, I'll talk about them in a second because, yeah, my goal is to capture him, brand him, then put him in the uh, secret chamber full of stuff that is not allowed for him, and then, even though that's merely roleplay on my part, that doesn't have any kind of mechanical Im impact, uh. it just feels a little bit more sensible, logical to me that that would result in him being removed as a political opponent as opposed to the other thing. So, I just want to grab a, a upgraded power here real quick. I'm ultimately saving up for stop time because being able to stop time solves every problem. But for now, I'm going to get agility because that will make us climb a bit more easily. I'll check my bone charms too. Yeah, these are all very combat related bone charms. There's a lot of combat related bone charms, but since we're trying to avoid combat for the most part, that's not very helpful to us. Which again reflects this dissonance in the game where you're told that the morally correct way to play and the, the way to play that gets you the good ending is um, non-lethal, but then it does not support non-lethal in any way. There's really only one good bone charm in the entire game for non-lethal play, and it is very good, but the bone charms are completely randomised, so there's every chance you won't get it. Anyway, um, yeah, so... I'm not going to listen to what these guys say, I'm just going to... Take advantage of this guy who happens to be in here. Because I can hide him somewhere useful. Being able to jump extra high is extra useful. So this audiograph I'm not going to listen to because it's quite long. However, it is a description, or it's the audio recording of the um, interrogation of a member of the Whaler gang. Because he's been seen using witchcraft. So this religion is essentially built around resisting witchcraft. It's kind of interesting for various number of reasons, but it's presented as almost secular. It's presented as almost being a non-religious organization that deals with um, occult matters. However, um, as you go along, you do you do realize that they, they do actually believe in... Well, obviously they believe in the supernatural because the supernatural physically exists in this world, but where's the guy? There's a guy patrolling around here that I don't want to run into in case I have to, you know, kill and or dart him. But yeah, so... The uh, the basic tenets of their religion are be very, very disciplined, uh, don't give in to temptation, don't do witchcraft. It makes sense that this world would have a movement resisting witchcraft because witchcraft and, more accurately, the influence of the Void is a fundamentally corrupting force in this world. It is generally used to hurt people or to help yourself by hurting people, and it is genuinely a corrupting force. It invokes madness, it provokes obsessions. So it's natural that there would be this kind of resistance. However, um, there's a lot of kind of both sides in Dishonored. It very much wants there to be no good guys in this world. There is an absolute um, 
huge awfulness to the way these guys go about their goals. This is absolutely a fascist organization that kidnaps and indoctrinates children, uh, that encourages people to spy on their neighbors and report them for minor infractions so that they can be fined or worse burned. To break him out of Cold Ridge Prison. But why Corvo? The one man feared throughout the Empire. He's as skilled as they say. He got through there with half the watch looking for him. I did not want to kill this guy. Um, I actually got behind him fast enough that I could have choked him out. However, I, um... I panicked. I panicked and killed him. Uh oh. So I failed to pick an object up, which dropped and made a noise, which startled somebody. Or did he? Oh, I dropped my my corpse that I was carrying. Hmm. Sounded like this guy was talking to someone, but I don't think he was. I think he was just talking to himself. So yeah, um, the Abbey of the Everyman is uh, only about 100, 200 years old as a religion. It was formed as a force to protect people. See, they've been spying on me. And there's these various other reports in this room of um, just people snitching on other people. Yep, someone was burning weird stuff over a fire. Must be witchcraft. She was peeking out from behind her curtains. Must be witchcraft. Yeah. So they make it... <clears throat> There's a fundamental dissonance in these kinds of things because they make it clear that it is following the parameters of, you know, real-life witch hunts where basically... And I mean that in the um, both the literal sense and the uh, figurative sense. Where people are blamed for things that are obviously not their fault, that just happened to coincide with odd behaviour or any that kind of thing. Where it's easy to just say, oh, someone looked at me funny and then a week later I was sick. You were just sick randomly. And in a logical world, that would be obvious. But yeah, um, it's easy for people to delude themselves or to just lie about people they don't like. But the dissonance comes in when you also really do have a malicious um, supernatural force that really is affecting people and that people really can use to hurt one another. That kind of makes it all a little bit more confusing and ambiguous. <laughs> I really should just carry this. So, they were set up for that purpose. They are a militant order. They are an order that trains in combat and maintains a standing army. All of its members are expected to be able to do <clears throat> military feats with military precision whenever necessary. Uh, which is understandable because, again, they fight witches. But, yeah, they kidnap children to do that. This is pretty unambiguous and it's even public knowledge. They encourage people to just give them their children, which is, again, not unusual for, um, at the very least, Christian-inspired churches in, in that fictional narratives, but, uh, hmm, let's see, there's some stuff I want to do downstairs. So my plan is basically to take care of the, the target and the main, the main plot elements and then, uh, next episode we'll finish exploring the place and, uh, ramble around a little bit, but yes, because there's quite a lot to see that isn't directly related to this main plot. But yes, yeah, so <clears throat> as a religion they can brook no dissent, they do not allow other religions to exist. There were once many religions in the Empire of the Isles, or more broadly in the Isles, because the Empire itself is only a couple hundred years old. If I drop him here, he should be invisible to those guys. Time to find out, I guess. Oh, shit! Well, that was kind of disastrous. I really didn't want to kill too many people. Um, yeah, so I guess they can see through the gaps in these things, which makes sense broadly, but... Uh, man, this is way less subtle than I was hoping for. I'm just going to take these guys up here so that they're not obvious. Anyway, so... The Abbey itself was formed um, in response to a very, like a specific kind of event, which is where the lit litany on the White Cliffs came from, um, which was their last kind of their great holdout against the uh, the last big covens of witches and so on. But they also used their position as a large militant order to wipe out all other religions, regardless of whether or not those religions are involved in the occult. It's uh kind of a bad look, guys. 
And so all of these things lead into one another. The fact that they are a state religion, that they have, um, you know, they are state sanctioned with regards to their violence and their uh, capacity to kidnap and indoctrinate children. That all of, you know, that they raise their members from childhood to believe fervently in their beliefs and to be incredibly disciplined. All of this is why they have such incredibly fascist iconography. Like, they have large red hanging banners. They talk about um, the degenerate and so on. But of course their leaders are uh, extremely um, corrupt. And I mean, it's just bad in general, fascism, I think we can all agree on that. So the other interesting thing about this is that this is the only chapter which lets you actually have a baked in method of killing your opponent. Every chapter has um, a non-lethal method of removing its main target. This is the only one that has a lethal method, like, programmed in as part of what happens. I think because of that it almost sets up a kind of um, a predisposition to think that this game might be a bit more like Hitman, um, and a bit less like, you know, Thief. But all of the rest are ultimately dynamic. It's up to you to decide and figure out how you do these things. No, I tell a lie. That's not true. The golden cat has a has one built-in built-in way of dealing with one of its two targets. Anyway, so they're here for their meeting. We know that he's trying to poison him. You can poison both of them, or you can switch the glasses so that Campbell poisons himself, which is my favourite method. And I think possibly what Canon Canon Corvo would do. The only reason I'm not doing that is because I have the benefit of being able to roleplay to myself that if I leave him in the open, people will find out that he. You know, well, did his various sins. Hard way. What was that, Campbell? Never mind. It's a stroke of luck for you, Captain. I'm forced to break out the real vintage. So now that both of their backs are to me, I'm going to be as fast as possible to do a few things here. First, this and... Okay, well that's unfortunate. Um, due to the way that it goes into slow time whenever you, you know... KO a guy uh, who is a mission target. Ah oh, man, this really didn't go the way I wanted it to. So depending on how that guard's behavior is randomized, because the behavior of guards is randomized within certain parameters, normally that guy is standing with his back to you, but there's a small chance he'll go and lie, lean against the wall. Because he went and leant against the wall, um, he was actually facing me when normally he wouldn't be. This is very unfortunate. So we're here in part to rescue Kerr now, so we're going to hide him on a ledge where he'll be nice and safe. Uh, you know, in the rain, the worst thing that's going to happen to him out here is that he'll catch cold. Then we're going to run off with Campbell and go uh, brand him and then leave him in his own cellar. So, the interesting thing to me about... Um, the Abbey of the Everyman, is that it is actually almost explicitly a reference to the Hammerite Church of the Thief games, the original Thief games, and I will talk about that a little bit more after we do some torture. Rise and shine, sunshine. It's not that unmist- can I not- Oh, I can't pick him back up again. That's frustrating. I had such a good plan. Maybe I- should I just- I, No, I should- I mean, I could just- no. I actually don't think the design of the brand is very unique. I feel it should be more detailed and more definitely, you know, being what it is. I think that that could be quite easily mistaken for just some kind of industrial accident or whatever. Um, you know, it's not exactly the end of their personhood. Because you could just move somewhere else and get a job as a as a belt sander or something and be like, yeah, no, I got I got hit by a machine in my last job. This is just how it goes. So it's frustrating that they won't let me do that, but I will at least leave the secret room open at the very bottom of the level on the grounds that, well, that's as close as I can get to what I was intending. So, yes, um, if you, maybe I should have slow timed again as I ran in here, because then I could have darted him, darted him, and then knocked out him. 
which probably would have worked, but you can see why stop time is so much more effective than slow time, I'm sure. So, the next thing we need to do is make sure that we get Martin out. Um, and then we'll be free to do a little bit of exploring. I'm actually going to switch on my objective markers, because when you rescue Martin, it specifically tells you that if he gets knocked out, you need to take him to a safe location. It does not tell you what that safe location is unless you have the markers on. I thought that that meant he just needed to not be in the building, but that's not the case. You won't count as rescuing him unless you stuff him in one very specific trash can. <laughs> that was close. Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, wow, I nearly just fucking dropped him to his death, which would have been disastrous. Why do I have an objective marker for the distillery district? Did I forget something? Ah, okay, that's why, because I still have that uh, mission task for Granny Rags that I'm definitely not doing. There we go, it's so that bin there. So I could probably do this without those guys seeing me, with a bit of luck. Make a safety save. I can just teleport straight into the bin as soon as they're not looking at me. But yeah, so um, the Hammerite Church is interesting because in the very first game, which let's not forget came out in like 1997, 1998, um, you're not going to look in the bin, are you? That'd be really inconvenient. Turn around. The Abbey doesn't train fools. I know someone is here. Okay, that should work. Okay, that didn't work at all. So, the thing about that is that part of the stealth mechanics of this game are that um, if anything alerts guards, they become much more observant. They're much more likely to spot you if they are already looking or they are already alerted. This is why uh, using crossbow bolts to distract them and move them around is pretty risky. It's kind of touch and go. You can't guarantee that they won't spot you if you do that. And you also can't guarantee that where, where they will go. Normally stealth games that have that kind of mechanic um, essentially have people go investigate where they he heard the sound coming from. Which makes sense and it's a fun way to be able to manipulate the AI to do stuff usefully. But um, in the instance of Dishonored specifically, it does um, result in that happening. Because they don't actually search specifically for where they heard the noise, they search the entire area once they become alerted. Usually you can use this to make them walk in uh, the direction you want them to, but it doesn't always work. So yeah, the thing about the Abbey of the Everyman is that or rather, the thing about the, the Hammerite Church is that they were presented very clearly as the good guys in that first game. They are basically just a stand-in for, you know, the medieval Christian church, because the original Thief games took place in a sort of a medieval punk setting, which, you know, kind of took cyberpunk styles and applied them to a uh, medieval-styled fantasy setting, you know, rather than a... Uh, um, any other kind of setting, or sci-fi setting. Anyway, um... Regardless, they were, despite being, you know, very kind of like, suffer not a witch to live, um... Guys in chainmail walking around talking about, I don't know, honour or whatever. Um... The first game presented them unambiguously as the good guys. Incidentally, this is not secret. This is not subtle. This is, um... This is the least secret secret door I've ever seen. It's... He's literally got one eye that has a gem in. It's like, it's not subtle. So, this is Campbell's secret chamber. This is actually where he leads, um... Kurnow, if you don't rescue Kurnow before then. He leads Kurnow down here and murders him by hand. Um, you can intervene at that point, or you can lay traps down here, or you can do any number of things to interact with that and essentially get away with a... Uh, rescuing rescuing Kurnell that way. But the important thing for us is that this is plenty of evidence of his um, 
you know, breaching of his tenets. Here is opulence, here is wealth, here is uh, the pleasures of the flesh in all of their many and varied varieties. I could listen to this, but it's basically just him saying, I want to kill that guy because he sucks. And here we have the first of the Sokolov portraits. These are valuable collectibles, of which there are several in the game. Each of them are unique. They're all different portraits of different people, different characters. This is the first one we, that we can find, and it is the one that he is mid-painting um, on that sunny day where we do the intro of the game. As you can see, because we drank the cider, the cider is not in this portrait. If you don't drink the cider off the table, it is present in this portrait. And um, you know what? I think he was right. I think Sokolov was right that having the, pain, the drink to draw the eye away from him works. As the foremost painter of his age, though, Sokolov is worth critiquing, and I think that this is an interesting pick for his uh, very first painting, because it's so much less finished than the others. Sokolov drifts, according to his inspiration, between Impressionism and Photorealism. All of his paintings are kind of like realist oil paintings, but they become more or less Impressionist based on how he feels about his subject. We can see that the High Overseer is very carefully grounded. His feet are planted on the ground, he exists within a corporeal world. What is around him is very clear. He knows where he is and who he stands. He is clearly a man of discipline, regardless of his honour or whatever, you know, whatever secret pleasures he, he performs. He is very clearly to the world a man of discipline. His back is straight, his arms are folded, he's rigid and unyielding. He stares off into the distance, implying some kind of deeper understanding of the world. But pay attention to the backdrop, it's completely blurry. While he himself, as a man, is grounded, his beliefs are completely changeable. The wider world in which he exists is irrelevant. The context of his understandings of things is irrelevant. All he cares about is the physical, is the, is the actual material realm beneath his feet. This is a man who should be staring into the sky, the night sky, to pay attention to the astrology that his, his religion puts so much faith in, or should be square onto the viewer, representing a an extremely solid um, grounding in his own beliefs. However, no, behind him, what do we get? His context, his context is irrelevant. His context is a blur. It means nothing. This is a man who, despite being extremely rigid, has no substance to his beliefs. So, um, yeah, there's a few areas left to explore and there's some valuables to go grab, but um, we're gonna go through here to do that. So I believe we've seen everything that's completely relevant at this point. I'll talk more about the Hammerites next time, since I meant to do that this time, but uh, yeah, that is going to be all for me today. Join me next time when we visit the kennels, and don't forget to, you know, share me with people because my god it means a lot to me. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this, you can also follow me on Twitter for updates, stream announcements, and one-tweet micro-reviews, or why not donate to me via Patreon or Ko-fi, or just share my work. Thank you so much for watching.